Hey everybody, this is Mark with The Thoughtful Gamer here with another three impressions, three questions video. This is my first impressions format. I think this is the third one of these that we've done and I want to start doing them more frequently. So be on the lookout and don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any new videos that come out. And this is a three impressions, three questions for Hadrian's Wall from Garfield Games. Uh, I got to play it for the very first time a couple of weeks ago, or maybe just a week ago, and I found it very interesting. I don't know how many more times I'm going to play it, so I decided to do a first impressions video. I don't own a copy. Uh, a friend brought it over and we played it then. I've been hearing some good things about it, but really had no idea what it was about uh, before playing, and then I discovered that it was, in fact, a heavy roll and write game. Uh, and this is kind of weird, but it's not even the first heavy roll and write game with a Roman theme that I've played. I have a copy of Rome and Roll uh, sitting on my shelf somewhere that I've got to review. I don't know why people are choosing this for heavy roll and write games. I think there was a third one. Anyways, let's talk about Hadrian's Wall. Uh, my first of the first impressions uh, is that this is a game about the simple pleasures of the domino effect. This is a game we, where you are constantly, uh, you're, you're getting resources from dice, from actually a card flipping, it's not a true roll and write, it's cards, uh, but I just call them roll and writes. You get resources from that, and then you spend those resources on a variety of different things, uh, and almost like every other time you spend a resource to do something, you get a different resource. So you're constantly doing these like chain effects, these uh, almost Rube Goldberg machines uh, type reactions where you cross one thing off on your sheet, which unlocks a new resource, which lets you cross a different thing off on your sheet, which lets you cross a different thing off. And there's all these chain reactions. And honestly, it's really fun. Like that's just a very simple pleasure in board gaming. And they based an entire game around it. It's honestly kind of shameless. Like they're like, "Hey, we want to do this thing. We want to have you have all these cool chain effects, and we're just gonna go wild with it." I would much rather have that than if they were very passive about it. I'd much rather it be shameless. My second impression is that everything is super tiny. I've got the sheets here from my game, and I mean, am I getting old, or is this like really tiny bits of information to physically see? on paper. And I've complained about this online uh, in a couple of reviews and on Twitter about card text getting old, but man, these are there's so many tiny boxes. And I'm a person who loves games that look like spreadsheets generally. Uh, but I want my spreadsheets to be legible. This was, you know, my neck was sore at the end because I was bending over. Like these glasses work, but Man, it's so much tiny information. It's not hard to comprehend once you learn the rules. It all makes sense, and it was actually pretty easy to learn, but it's still really tiny icons in there, and I, I don't get it. Why couldn't they make it bigger? Why couldn't this be like a normal 8.5 by 11 size sheet of paper? Was there a manufacturing problem? Uh, or, or difficulty where they didn't sell notepads of that size. I don't know what it was, but I wish it was a larger piece of paper. The third impression is that the game works with a couple of very familiar cadences, things you see in these types of resource conversion Euro games a lot. Uh, so the first one is this little push your luck game. Every round, and there are six rounds in the game, uh, there's going to be invaders, and they're going to invade either on the left, middle, or right side uh, a certain number of times, and that's just completely random. And if you don't have defenses built up, you get penalized uh, when they break through your wall, hence the name Hadrian's Wall, and then you get rewarded if you block uh, all the defenders in any given round. Uh, so there's a little push-your-luck game, because other than the small, uh, fairly modest reward for defense, most of your points are going to be acquired elsewhere, but you don't want to get the penalties. The penalties are way worse than the bonuses you get from successfully defending. So it's got that thing. You see that in a lot of stuff on Feld games. Uh, Amerigo comes to mind. Uh, I think Bora Bora had something like that. Um, you, of course, have the whole feeding your workers thing. It's basically a feeding your workers mechanism, except it's in the theme of, or the flavor of defense from invaders. It's just a thing you gotta try to do uh, in order to not get hit with large penalties. Um, 
but it's also slightly random. So do you, how how close do you want to cut it? Do you want to uh, do you want to cut it, you know, really close and risk it, or do you want to be extra safe but but lower your potential number of points you might get by the end of the game? You know that kind of question. Uh, the next thing is clearly delineated strategic paths um, on this second sheet. So this first sheet here, you get two of them, is basically this top half is your wall defense mostly. The middle is kind of resourcey stuff, and then this bottom is your score basically. The second sheet is these five zones. Um, and you're not going to necessarily be able to do a lot with all of them. I focus mainly on two, like two and a half out of the five. Uh, but it's got these five things. Here are five different things you can do. And typically you're going to be rewarded by specializing uh, instead of just going really shallow in all of them. So it's got these very clearly delineated strategic paths, with some which sometimes works. Sometimes it feels a bit artificial. It's like, okay... People call for games with different strategies, so we are going to outline exactly what the different strategies are. Sometimes that doesn't work. The final familiar cadence in the game is these kind of choke points around resource conversion. You'll see this in games like Zulkin. Um, I can't think of another one that comes to mind. I, I guess Catan, really, right? Where a big part of the choke point of the game, of the tension of where you're trying to be most efficient is around acquiring the right resources. Like I said before, you're getting tons of resources, but they may not be in a color that you want. Um, and I should be careful with the word resource because one of the things is literally called a resource, but I'm talking about generally resources, different colors of meeples and goods. They all have some kind of thematic connection, but it's colors, right? You're gonna think of them as colors. Yeah, you're limited in actions. If you're not, like, you get lots of stuff. The real choke point is if you're going to want to score very well and specialize well is getting the right combination of things. And that's where this kind of choke point of resource conversion comes to mind. All that to say that there's a lot of familiarity in this game. There's not a whole lot that in, in this game that you haven't seen in a bunch of other Euro games. It just takes a different form of roll and write or flip and write, whatever you want to call it. Now let's move to the questions. So in this format, I talk about a couple first impressions and uh, three questions of things I'm going to be asking myself if I play in the future. What am I doubting? What am I not sure about? The first thing I'm not sure about is if this is even worth it as a multiplayer game. It seems like it really, really wants to be a solo game, and it might be a really excellent solo game. The problem with multiplayer is that there's almost no interaction between the players. Like there's just one tiny bit of interaction there. And the entire game is just staring at your paper, trying to puzzle through all these different branching paths you're trying to convert and spend resources through. And so the game is like you flip over a couple cards and then you spend 10 to 20 minutes, maybe on average, maybe that's a slight exaggeration, we'll say 10 minutes, just staring at papers and like muttering to yourself, which to an outside observer probably sounds really funny because you got these two people who are playing a game together and they're just muttering, oh, if I do this, I get this, and if I convert that, but they're not listening to each other because they're concentrating. So I don't know how much it works as a multiplayer game, like you certainly can play it multiplayer, but it sure seems like it wants to be a, a, a solo game. And I don't say that for a lot of what people call multiplayer solitaire games. A lot of them actually do have really subtle bits of interaction, or at least it's very fun to see what other people are doing. This one, you're going to be so buried in your paper that you're not even going to look at what your opponents are doing, really. The second question is, why do I even care about this theme, or even how do I interact with it? Why is it Roman? I don't understand. I don't get a particular satisfaction from Roman stuff. Like, it's fine. I've seen it a lot. There's general Roman societal ideas. Uh, but I don't understand why this game needs to be this theme or why it couldn't have been something else. Uh, maybe something more original and exciting. It doesn't, like, sure, you have Hadrian's Wall and you have defenses and you're fighting off barbarians, I guess, or Gauls, I don't know. Or Hadrian's, I guess, or Saxons. I, I my my sense of my sense of history is very poor. 
So, I don't know why they chose it. I don't care about it. I don't think the game makes you care about it. And I think the game could have been more interesting if they had thought of something a lot more original to interact with this kind of domino thing they clearly wanted to play around with. Um, so, I don't know why I care about the thing. That's what I'm going to be questioning. Maybe there's some deeper, subtle stuff in there, but I really doubt it. My third and final question is, is there a solution to this game? There are very, very few random effects. The wall defense, like who attacks where, is the biggest random effect. Other than that, there's slight changes in which starting resources you get each round, and there's a couple of other very small randomized effects that come on the cards. Having said that, though, it seems like it's a puzzle they want you to solve. I don't know if the random stuff that you get is enough to overcome the potential of a simply best path in the game. I don't know what that is, and maybe that's satisfying. Maybe people will find this is the strategy, um, or at least a couple of viable strategies that will always score the most points, and finding that is the what they get from the game. We saw that with Ganshan Clever. Like It was a fun game, but there was a best way to play if you're going for high score. My question is, uh, is that going to follow the same path with Hadrian's Wall? Obviously, with a more complex game, uh, but is that kind of the goal here? And if so, that's fine. Um, it's not going to it's not gonna blow the walls out, or uh, is that even a real expression? I don't know. Uh, but, you know, that seems like what it might be. Anyways, those are my first impressions of Hadrian's Wall. I definitely would play the game again. Uh, I'm probably not going to go out and try to buy it. Uh, I don't know. If there was an online implementation of Chest Out Solo like Gunshot Clever had for a, a while when I was playing, or I assume still have, I was playing that quite a bit till I got kind of tired of it. That seems like the experience uh, that Hadrian's Wall would give, which is fine. Um, but again, I don't know. Why is it Roman? Like, we see so many Roman games, uh, Roman themed games. It doesn't make any sense to me. Anyways, thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, to see more from The Thoughtful Gamer, again, subscribe to the YouTube channel. I'm going to try to do weekly uploads of videos, but most of what I do is written. And for that, go to thethoughtfulgamer.com. You can subscribe there so you don't miss out on anything. You get an email whenever I post, which is going to be uh, about twice a week. Uh, and I've also got a podcast, not posting necessarily regularly, uh, but we'll be posting very soon my top games of 2020, and then in about a month, I'm going to do a new version of my top 100 games of all time. All that's going to be on the podcast. And finally, if you'd like to support The Thoughtful Gamer, go to patreon.com slash The Thoughtful Gamer. You can support uh, me there. Thanks for watching, everybody. Talk to you soon.